Thank you. Good to be with you today. A little bit of change uh, strategy. We've listened to a bunch of panels, very interesting discussions. Let me get an idea for the audience today. How many of you are involved in some company, some startup, some initiative that's less than two years old? How many people are doing something? Everyone almost. How many people call themselves a CEO of that entity, activity, whatever? Okay. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of the transition from uh, founder to CEO, how that happens, and, and what you need to think about. Uh, my career, uh, as mentioned, I just wrote a book called The CEO Tightrope. That's my attempt to put a methodology around the CEO job. It's kind of interesting to me if you go out on Amazon or whatever, if you want to be a sales guy, you can download about 20 different books on how to be a sales guy, how to run a sales process. If you want to be a marketing person, you can run, read all kinds of books on marketing. Then you go type in CEO methodology and you find almost nothing. You find a few anecdotal biographies of folks writing about their 20 years of career as a CEO of GE or something like that, but not a lot of methodology around how you do the job. And so this is what my attempt to do that. Um, and that the experience for the book came from a couple of stints as CEO running a company called NetQOS that we took from zero to about 60 million in revenue and sold in 2009. And then a company called uh, Cash IQ that we took from zero to uh, getting a product and sold for $100 million in 2012. And so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to start with stages of the company. And, and for many of you, you're in a stage right now where you just laying the egg. Uh, and that conversation usually involves alcohol and pizza, uh, where you're trying to figure out what it is you want to be when you grow up, what would be success for your business, what does it look like, how, oh, and you believe you have the next great idea and you're going to take over the world. And then the next stage is you maybe manage to raise some money, you manage to put a little bit of a team together, and you're basically a project manager. And a lot of you may be in that stage of the bit seeing a business through where everything's about uh, tactical issues. You've got a million to-do items. You're trying to ship the product. You're trying to find a customer and a bunch of very tactical issues. And then if you're very successful and maybe you raise some money and you, you, everything's great now, you have people, you have 20 or 25 people, and suddenly now there's this thing called a CEO job that starts to exist, and you have a whole business. You have customers that have concerns. You have employees that have concerns. Now you maybe have shareholders that have concerns, and you show up every month for a board meeting, and they want to know how their investment's going and how their return's going to get. And that really gets into a real, what I consider kind of the real CEO job. And a lot of people can do very well in the lay the egg and project manager stage because it's familiar to them. It's things they've done before. They've built products before in their past career. But not a lot of people have experience in the CEO job. Most CEOs are first-time CEOs. And it's kind of like being a head football coach at a major university. You kind of get one shot at it. If you do really well and you win a few national championships, you know they name the stadium after you. If you lose a bunch of games, you get fired, and now you're the offensive coordinator for Podunk U, you know? And so that, that's kind of what happens with the CEO. And so I spend a lot of time in my book trying to guide people. I don't think the CEO job's anything mystical. I don't think it's anything harder than necessarily any other job. But what I will tell you about this job, it is, it is really different as you go through scaling a company. It's a really different experience than you've probably had in every other job you've had in a company. And so many people have a functional area of expertise that they develop in a company and they become a really good sales guy, let's say, and then they become a really good sales manager, and then they become a really good sales VP. And every time when a problem comes to their desk, it's a sales problem. And they're typically the expert in the room. And maybe they haven't seen the exact problem that comes to their desk, but they've seen a problem very similar. And their judgment on how to solve that problem is the best available judgment that anyone in that room has. And so they're used to being an expert, and they're used to making the decisions. And then, some, then sometimes one day somebody walks in the room and says, hey, John, you're our worldwide sales VP, but Joe, the CEO, just quit. We think you'd make a great CEO. And then John walks into that CEO office, and nine out of the ten problems that come to him aren't sales problems. There are problems that involve other areas of the company, things he's never thought about. We need to get a new lease, boss. We got this, somebody's trying to sue us. We need to hire some people in marketing. We need to do, what's the HR policy going to be? A whole bunch of issues that this person's never, never had to consider in their career. And so eventually, of course, as we go through these stages, eventually shareholders want return. 
And so the ability to execute on these three stages, creating the business, scaling the company, and delivering return to shareholders will determine whether you get a stadium named after you or maybe an alumni association that wants, to, uh, wants your money all the time or whether you get uh, sent back to Podunk U to try again. So what is the job of the CEO? This is a really interesting question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think the main reason CEOs fail, first-time CEOs fail, is they don't really have any idea what the job should be. So they take whatever that comes to their desk, whatever items that somebody walks in with, and they deal with those problems. Because as the project manager CEO, when they got the company off the ground, that was the right thing to do. But once you get to scale and have a company and you're 20 or 25 employees and you got shareholders and all these other issues, that's not the right way to approach the job. So the first thing CEO has to do is own the vision. Okay, and I use the word own here. That doesn't have to create the vision. There can be many people involved in creating the vision, but they have to have a gut feel for that vision. And it includes, I put strategy here, but it includes more than strategy. It's all about the mission of the company. What do we want to be? What would success be? When I talk to founders of businesses, one of my first questions that I always ask them is, what is success? Can you define it in tangible terms? And if I went and asked each of the employees in your company what success is for this endeavor, would they give the same answer? I mean, that's where the football coaches have it easy, right? If you start off the year at Alabama, your goal is to win the national championship. Every football player on that team understands success this year for us to win the national championship. But in your endeavors, in your startups, does everybody even know what success is? Or are we so busy trying to have success that we haven't even defined where we're trying to run to? Second thing you got to do is provide the proper resources. Companies fail most often because they run out of money. Uh, and while that sounds very obvious and trite, uh, that's the job of the CEO is to make sure that you never run out of money. It's also the job of the CEO to make sure you never run out of people resources. I am always, as a CEO of companies, I am always recruiting. If I come to an event like this and I have coffee with somebody, I'm thinking about, hey, could they potentially provide value to my organization sometime in the future? Uh, Capital and, and, and human resources are the two keys, but there are other resources that the CEO has to provide. Outside expertise. A lot of you are here for this conference and, and participating because you believe you're going to meet people and gain out knowledge that you wouldn't have experienced otherwise. It's the job of the CEO to bring that knowledge back into the company because everybody else in the company is kind of focused on getting the job done day to day. Next piece, uh, build the culture. Okay, and, and what is the culture? The culture is the way things happen in a company and what gets rewarded. And it's ultimately the CEO's responsibility. CEO can't de delegate that. The CEO is the mom and dad of the company. Okay, and so the CEO has to own that culture and build that culture and should do it in a way that it, they're very cognizant of, of what they're doing and understanding how they're doing it. Then finally, they need to make good decisions. Decisions are the lubrication that makes the engine of an organization run. If you wait too long to make decisions, the, the organization just kind of seizes up. Many of you have probably been in uh, companies where it took forever to get a decision from the top of the organization, and you just, you know, you were like, this, this doesn't work. I mean, we just can't do anything if we're not making good decisions. And if you do all four of those things, then you can do the final thing, which is deliver performance. But here's where many early stage CEOs struggle. They think about everything in terms of delivering performance, okay? But they don't do the first four necessary steps. And you have to do the first four necessary steps to prepare your people to deliver performance. Again, back to the football coach analogy. If you're coaching football, you don't tell your right tackle, go win the game. You don't tell your right tackle, go score a touchdown. What do you tell the right tackle? You tell the right tackle to block the left defensive end, and if he knocks him on his butt, go hit the linebacker. Okay, And that's exactly what you have to do for your organizations. You have to go through this process of breaking down what it is that everyone in the organization does. We'll talk more about this in a minute when I tell you about what I'm doing with Chorus, but that's a key piece, breaking down taking going from a vision that says how we're going to be successful and what success is to day-to-day -day steps that people can take to be successful. 
So the line I use is the better you are as CEO, the less you have to do and the more you can do. What does that mean? That means if you're in a job as CEO and you're just taking input all the time and running around crazy and always on the phone and always emailing and don't have time for anybody, you're not doing the CEO job right. Okay, the CEO job is a strategic job, and if you do it right, you have a lot of time to be very strategic about how you influence the organization. Okay? And so there's a very interesting dichotomy with the CEO. The interesting thing is anyone in the company that's in a management position can do management, including the CEO, and management is merely making decisions about those things you have control over who you hire, where they're going to sit, what their title is, what the vacation policy is. That's all management stuff. Leadership is influencing things that you don't have control over. Okay, Again, anybody in the organization may be able to influence things. But then the CEO has this third piece, and the CEO is unique in that third piece in that he has command. He has responsibility for everything that goes on while having very limited control of actually what happens. I think if you talk to most CEOs and the bigger the organization, the worse it, get, worse it gets, they feel like they have very little direct control over what's going on in their organization. So when you get in this situation where you have this total responsibility but limited control, there are a lot of errors that get made. And I'm going to show you some of the failure modes, and I talk about these in detail in the book that CEOs make. See if you recognize any of these failure modes in your past experience. So we have the first, the load the wagon CEO. This is the idea that since I have this responsibility, okay, but I don't, but I don't have any control, I have, to dis, I have to divorce myself from responsibility for the outcome. So if there's a problem, it's somebody else's problem. So these are the CEOs who give the entire responsibility to the workforce and say, well, if they didn't execute right, it's their problem. Okay, they were stupid. The employees didn't know how to do it. Okay, and then we have the opposite of that. The employee who the CEO who wants to take control of everything. Ever worked for the micromanager, the guy who comes in your office every 30 minutes, tries to tell you exactly how to do you do the job. Okay, so he's there. He thinks he can ride along and just crack the whip whenever he needs it, make things happen. Right. So neither one of those are particularly effective. So so what do we really want? Well, we want somebody who provides leadership in an organization. And so what is that leadership? Well, there are three pieces I talk about in the book, and I think these are very fundamental to every position of leadership. First one is credibility. Do people believe that what you're telling them is true? Okay. Once as a leader, people don't believe what you're saying anymore, you can no longer be a leader. Many startup CEOs struggle with this. They don't distinguish between what I call what they know to be true and what they hope to be true. Okay. I'm the CEO of a small company. I hope in two years we sell $10 million of revenue. I don't know we're going to sell $10 million of revenue. What I know is that if we get 500 leads and each lead turns into $10,000 of business, that that will generate $10 million of revenue. But you have to be very specific about what you know to be true as a leader and what you hope to be true. Many CEOs fail because they talk about all the time what they hope to be true like they know it to be true. Next concept is the idea of competence. People have to believe you know something about what you're doing. The standard's not as high as credibility. Credibility, you have to have absolute credibility. Competence, they just have to get a clue that you think you know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, okay, and you have to not run the, run the ship off the tracks too often. Uh, but they'll give you a little bit of a break. Uh, it does, you don't have to be perp perfect. And then the third one that many people struggle with in the day-to-day -day hassle of getting a startup off the ground and all the tactical issues is the idea of caring. People have to believe the easiest metaphor I use for that one is you're not going to be first on the lifeboat. Okay, if the, if the sh ship starts sinking, that you're not running for the lifeboat first. No one expects you uh, to go down with the ship as the CEO, but they expect you to at least be the last guy on the lifeboat. And so you put those three things together, and that defines what leadership is. And if you're doing the job as the CEO right, it ought to look like that, okay? And so I use this picture because you have a thoroughbred horse here that runs at about 45 miles an hour. Now, is the jockey in control of that horse at 45 miles an hour? <laughs> no, he, he's not really in control, okay? He has influence, 
And if he does it perfectly and suddenly, he can move that horse inside one, outside the next. Uh, but if he, what, what happens if he tries to grab the reins and yank that horse in one direction? Okay, he's going to end up with some broken bones on the track, right? And so that's the job of the CEO, particularly in a high growth company. That's what it feels like. Okay, you're not in control, but you have a little bit of influence and you're going along for the ride and you hope you've got the fastest horse available. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about what, whoop, let me get through this, whoop, let me go back, one too many. Uh, and so kind of my fundamental belief of what great CEOs do is that they create great jobs. And so you know that a CEO of an organization is a great CEO if people want to work there and people are excited about working there. Okay, And so that's what gets me excited every day about building startups is that I can create great jobs for people. Now, I'm going to make a change here and talk about what we're doing now, a company called Chorus. So any of you PowerPoint snobs in the audience, yes, I just changed templates. Don't get too upset. Don't leave the audience. Yeah. Okay. And Chorus is a company built to help CEOs take these principles I've just discussed, put a little software around it with a methodology, and help them run their organizations better. So the mission of Chorus is to make our customers the best-run companies on Earth. Okay, and we think there's a lot of opportunities to make most companies better run. And then that vision translates to a powerful, cohesive organizations that get the right shit done. My team made me put shit. I didn't want to use shit, but they made me. Okay. And so we'd love to talk to you. If you have an organization, we'd love to talk to you about Chorus. We believe 10 years from now, people will look back at people running businesses today and go, why didn't the CEO have any software that tells people what to do in their organization? Okay, and this came from a conversation I had when we sold my company NetQOS to uh, Computer Associates. I sat down with the CEO of Computer Associates. We're having lunch, you know, and I'm basically handing him the keys to my 260-person company that he just paid $200 million for. And I said, okay, could you tell me how my people are supposed to know what's changed? What are they supposed to go do tomorrow different than what they did yesterday? I was moving on out of the organization. I wasn't in control anymore. You know, what am I supposed to tell my people? And he kind of gave me this blank stare and didn't, didn't really, you know, thought about it. He's like, well, uh, well, uh, and then it hit him. Okay, he was running a multi-billion dollar company, and there was no written system by which people in the organization knew what to do. Okay, I think 10 years from now, we'll look back just like we look back now for people in sales organizations and we say, how did people run sales organizations 10 years ago when they didn't have Salesforce and every salesperson used Salesforce religiously in their company? Okay, I think we'll look back 10 years from now and say, how did companies run without a written system of record that told people what it was they were supposed to do and allowed them to tell the organization how the outcome was going to be? And so that's what we do at Chorus. So love to talk to you about that. I'll be signing books up here in the upper, uh, on the second floor if anyone's interested. Thanks.